And then we'll get these turned on after. When the uh, Q&A. Great. <coughs> On behalf of the Department of Economics, on behalf of the Department of Economics, hello, and welcome to this panel discussion. My name is Swati Bhatt. I would like to thank our panelists and you for taking the time to participate in this event. Let me introduce to you uh, our moderator and first panelist, Professor Alan Blinder. Professor Blinder is the Gordon Renshaw Memorial Professor of Economics here at Princeton University. He served as Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board from 94 through 1996. Prior to that, he was a member of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, and he's also founded the Center for Economic Policy Studies, which supports economic policy research here at Princeton. Join me in welcoming Alan Blinder. Uh, thank you, Swati. And I, I just want to say that Swati Bhatt is responsible for uh, uh, getting the idea, which I gather was induced first by some students, and actually executing on very short notice uh, this uh, uh, forum. Uh, we're going to speak of the uh, actual and potential economic impacts of the uh, multiple tragedies that befell the United States on September 11th. But uh, before we do that, and in deference of the fact that in my mind, and I'm sure in the minds of everybody on the panels, on the panel, the e economic impacts of this are dwarfed by the fact that this was, in the first instance, a mass murder. Uh, I, I'd like you all to join me in a brief moment of silence. Thank you very much. We're going to uh, organize the panel uh, as follows. And by the way, I should say, especially to the students who may be coming in and out of classes, walk in and walk out as you need to, uh, to meet your uh, other uh, responsibilities. There will be people drifting in at various times. And when you need to drift out, just drift out. Uh, we're going to organize this as follows. Each of the panelists is going to speak, I hope, on, some, on a somewhat different, although there will no doubt be overlaps, aspect of the uh, economic uh, ramifications of, the, uh, of these events. Uh, I'm going to start by sort of setting the uh, broad stage in terms of uh, why and how this is an adverse uh, economic event, and in a very, very rough sense, what we might do about it in terms of policy responses. Uh, the first speaker on my right, uh, your left, is uh, Professor Paul Krugman, uh, who is uh, known for many things, but not the least of which is his twice weekly column uh, in the New York Times. And uh, Paul will follow me and speak about, mu in much more detail, about the actual and potential policy responses. I think that's right, Paul. I don't know about the detail. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, following him on the far end of the uh, uh, podium uh, is Jose Schenkman, uh, who's an expert on uh, financial markets and will be speaking on the financial market uh, implications. Uh, in between Jose and Paul is Professor Alan Kruger. By the way, I saw a lot, some of the advanced advertising of this in mistakenly listed uh, Ben Bernanke, our department chairman, who was going to try to get in here, but it was totally sandwiched between two other uh, commitments. He was going to sort of run in and run out, and we uh, relieved him of the responsibility thanks to the willingness of Alan Kruger uh, to uh, take his place. Alan is going to speak on something you may have read about if you read his column uh, in this morning's New York Times about the what can we learn about from historic parallels. Uh, I'm going to touch on that myself extremely. Uh, briefly. We'll be joined later by Professor Peter Kennan, an expert on international finance, who's teaching right now and is going to come at the end of his uh, class. And all of this will leave plenty of time, and indeed, to my mind, this is the primary purpose for question and answer. I, I think there seem to be uh, the evidence in this room suggests there are a lot of questions on people's mind about 
what this might or might not do to the economy, and we want to be able to take as many of those uh, as we can. Okay, so without further ado, let me, uh, let me begin. Um, uh, I would love to be able to uh, start by telling you that in terms of the economy, at least, uh, these horrors were no big deal and the economy would chug along as we, to the extent it was chugging along before, uh, as before uh, September 11th. I don't think that's true, however. Uh, let me take a minute or two just to review how things looked on, the, on September 10th of this year, emphasizing the United States, but just briefly saying something about some other countries. Uh, in the United States, the outlook for the economy had been weakening to some extent. There were a lot of doomsayers indicating uh, um, much more negative scenarios than I thought likely, but these scenarios were not impossible. The news was not all bad. To me, it was the classic half-full, half-empty cup, and you could look at it uh, either way with some validity. More important than uh, whether the full half or the empty half exceeded 50%, was the fact, in view of what's happened since, was the fact that the atlas that was holding up this economic world was the American consumer, uh, who, American consumers, who were spending at rates that puzzled most of us economists given the other events. And I'm talking about uh, before September 11th, uh, referring in particular to decreasing levels of employment um, as the economy weakened, which one normally expects to take a bite out of consumer spending, both directly from people losing their jobs and indirectly from the fear of job loss of people who see their neighbors losing their jobs. And in addition to that, there was the so-called wealth effect, or in this context called the negative wealth effect, which is the financial market an economics jargon term for the simple idea that holders of American stocks, and most of those were Americans, although plenty of foreigners hold them as well, holders of American stocks had since the spring of the year 2000 uh, suffered very, very large capital gain, uh, capital losses, excuse me, multiple trillions in uh, capital losses. And th that too would normally, according to historic norms, be expected to have taken a bite out of consumer spending. Up through September 10th, it didn't appear to have taken much of a bite. And that was puzzling people and also worrying people. So the question on my mind and on the minds of a number of other economists then was how long would the consumer hold out? Or another way to put that is could the consumer hold out until help arrived? What was the help? Well, the help was coming from three main sources. Lower energy prices, to which I will uh, return. Uh, Federal Reserve easing of monetary policy, that is lowering interest rates, which had been in train since the beginning of the year, but which worked with a long lag. And hence, to the extent that this medicine was, was actually going to work, and some questions had been raised about it, you would not have expected it to be working already in a major way by September. It's in the pipeline or in the circulatory system uh, with, the, uh, with the salutary effects still to come. And similarly, the tax rebate had just happened. And there was a question of how much was going to be spent. So the, the issue basically, in my view, had been for a long time, could we get through the second and third quarters of this year because by the winter, by the fourth quarter and by the first quarter of next year, things ought to look better. Very briefly about the other major economies, Europe was palpably weakening and gradually, I emphasize the word gradually, taking its head out of the sand. The original European view of the slowdown in the United States was that's there and we're here and we'll be fine. Uh, that view increasingly became to look untenable uh, in Europe. It always looked untenable from here. And uh, the European authorities were gradually reaching that conclusion, but slowly. Uh, Japan, the Japanese economy could only be called a disaster area, and I'm talking about prior to September 10th, and just looking worse and worse. And finally, uh, last, and in terms of GDP least, but in terms of neediness most, 
Uh, in many of the poorer countries in the world, especially the emerging markets, there were real perils from the fallout of the declining, or not declining, but slowly growing U.S., European economies and the declining Japanese economy, plus some specific problems in some of the emerging markets. That was the setting on September 10th uh, when the world changed in a most horrible way. Uh, I want to focus on only two aspects uh, of, this, uh, of the changes that this tragedy has brought, apart, brought about. One is obvious from what I said before, uh, what will happen to the consumer? Consumer confidence appeared to have been falling on the eve of the tragedy and must have fallen very significantly since then. You can look at historical episodes like the Gulf War and other things which show very dramatic declines in consumer confidence for events that affect the United States but are actually happening in far off lands. Here's something, here we had uh, what amounts to a military scale attack on the city of New York and also on Washington uh, right at home. Uh, so one can only imagine what this might do to consumer confidence and more importantly from an economic perspective, consumer spending. Because as I said, that was the force that was holding up the economy. This is a very powerful force, by the way. In the last quarter, consumer spending and housing, which also comes out of the consumer sector, amounted to 73% of GDP. So this is no small deal. The GDP tends to follow its 73%. If the other 27% is doing something quite extraordinary, it can pull the whole thing along but the GDP does tend to follow its 73 uh, percent. So just do the math. Uh, if the consumer would decide, this is not a forecast, but I just want to just run through the math with me for a second. If the consumer would decide to spend 3 percent less than he or she otherwise would spend, that doesn't seem like an untoward or wild or crazy uh, reaction to that. With consumer spending amounting to more than two-thirds of GDP, that takes two percentage points off the GDP. If that all happens in a single quarter, that knocks the GDP down at an annualized rate, which is the way we report the data, by 8 percent. That's an extremely severe uh, contraction. I look for some historical parallels. So that was a hypothetical calculation. Uh, and I came up with two, very briefly. Uh, the last recession we had was precipitated, ironically, by the uh, Gulf War. And in the fourth quarter of 1990, uh, consumer spending fell at a 3.3 percent annual rate, and the GDP fell at a 3.2 percent uh, annual rate. The quarter before that, when the, when the war, when the uh, invasion of Kuwait uh, took place, consumption still managed to rise uh, uh, slightly. A better parallel, I think, uh, not geopolitically, but in terms of uh, effects on consumers, or I fear in terms of effects on consumers, came in 1980. Now, a lot of young people in this audience are a bit young to remember 1980, uh, but I'm not. Uh, in 1980, uh, the, the president of, in, this, in March of 1980, the president of the United States at the time, Jimmy Carter, uh, requested in a television uh, address that Americans put away their credit cards and stop spending. This was supposed to fight uh, inflation. Well, amazingly, some Americans did that, and consumer spending actually fell in a single quarter by 2.2 percent, that is annualized 8.8 percent, and the U.S. economy contracted violently in that quarter, a negative 8 percent rate of growth for a single quarter. There's still some debate among economic historians whether we should call that a recession or not, but it certainly didn't feel good uh, while it was happening. These are the kinds of things that uh, worry me now. And what they say, just to lead into the policy uh, issue, what they say to me is that the palliatives that are applied by national policymakers ought to be aimed at the consumer, ought to be targeted at places where we can bolster or boost, either support or boost consumer spending. The second aspect I want to uh, just mention, and I'll be briefer on this one, is oil prices, or energy prices more generally, but Middle Eastern oil prices uh, especially. I'm going to be brief because the truth is nobody knows what to think or say 
about this because nobody at this point, I don't think anybody, but maybe a few people in the Pentagon and the CIA, but I think probably at this point nobody knows the form, the scope, and even the geography of the U.S. retaliation. One can spin scenarios that has this surgically limited to hilly areas in Afghanistan where hardly anybody lives and which are sufficiently remote from the Persian Gulf that one might suppose it has negligible to zero effect on the world oil market. On the other hand, one can easily spin scenarios involving other Middle Eastern countries, especially oil producing countries or their neighbors that have potentially drastic effects on the price of oil. In 1973 and in 1979-80, as we recall, very large spikes in the price of oil led to very severe worldwide recessions. In 1990, in the Gulf War, a severe but very brief spike in oil prices also precipitated a recession. And at this point, I know nothing, and neither does anyone else, about what might happen in the world oil market, but it, but it is uh, a real concern. Now, what to do, very briefly. I already mentioned, I alluded to fiscal policy by saying the policy uh, medicine ought to be aimed at the consumer uh, in some way. And of course, we already had a tax rebate uh, paid out before this happened. Uh, as you know, the Congress has already appropriated another $40 billion, and more is coming day by day. Nobody knows yet how much the total new spending uh, induced by this crisis will amount to, but it's likely to be sizable. The Federal Reserve, I had mentioned before, has already responded with an additional cut in uh, interest rates of one half a percentage point on uh, Monday morning. That did not expect to stop the stock market from crumbling. Uh, but it is there, and I suspect there will be more coming from the Fed as well. The point I want to make about this is that none of this medicine, the monetary medicine or the fiscal medicine, can possibly work as fast as the potential drop in consumer spending. I keep thinking about March of 1980, when the consumer stopped on a dime and the economy contracted violently for a couple of quarters. Fiscal and monetary policy simply cannot and never do work as fast as that, and that is the danger. Last thought. The silver lining in all of this, the potential silver lining, is that it is a statistical regularity, though, though not always true, that in, in terms of business cycles, that the sharper you fall, the better, the faster you come back. And beyond that, we know that this fiscal and monetary policy weapon, medicine was already being applied to the U.S. economy well before the tragic events of September 11th. It is most, most unusual, I would say historically unprecedented, that prior to the onset of a recession, both the fiscal arm and the monetary arm of the government were in full, well, I won't say full, substantial expansionary throttle, trying to gun the economic engines before the recession started. It's, by, it's a coincidence that this is, this is the situation uh, right now, and that gives me at least some reasonable expectation. I would say it's a better than a 50-50 bet that uh, after a contraction which might be of significant magnitude, we come back quite strongly. Thank you, and I'll pass it now to Paul Krugman. Okay, well, um, let me try to just say a few things. Um, I think the first thing to say is that if this had happened in, uh, in a different economic environment, we would have been fairly relaxed. There would have been a, uh, uh, no doubt, I think Ellen makes a compelling case, there would have been a, you know, a bad quarter uh, as people in shock stopped spending. Uh, and, uh, but we would have thought of this as something we could easily deal with. Um, the fact that it occurs at a time when we were already having some serious uh, doubts about the efficacy of, of, of our economic medicines uh, is what's alarming. Uh, and if I had to say what, what the, uh, in terms of the uh, objective economic policy 
discussion. Actually, uh, the situation now is the same as it was uh, on September 10th, only more so. Uh, the, same, the same dilemmas and the same kinds of conclusions about what we ought to be doing uh, are pretty much uh, in, in place. Uh, what has changed, but in ways we're not entirely sure about, is the politics. And uh, that, that, that could change everything, or it could also turn out to be the same as before, only more so. Uh, so let me talk about the, the situation as it appeared to be. Um, we were facing a slowdown, whether or not it was a recession, uh, in the technical sense, I think doesn't really matter for this purpose, uh, which uh, if, if you were to go back and ask where did it come from, I'd say probably the, the key element was that there was a huge expansion of business investment uh, during the, the, the bubble years and then an overhang of, of capital that, that businesses wished they hadn't bought, which made it kind of hard to keep the economy uh, running along. Um, we were responding to it mainly uh, as we normally do to slowdowns with, with monetary policy. Fed was cutting rates, and, and that's our normal first line of defense against economic slowdown. Um, the great concern was that, uh, that it wouldn't work. Uh, by, uh, by last Monday, the, the Fed had cut the Fed funds rate, the, short, the overnight interest rate, from 6.5 to 3.5. And while everyone always says these things don't happen right away, it was really hard to see where the, the effects were going to come. You were, uh, you were not, there was some concern about whether that policy was going to work. And uh, always lurking in the back of, of my mind on these things is the fact that we know of one major advanced economy that has reduced interest rates all the way to zero and not been able to generate a recovery, which is Japan. And so the, the question is, is there a Japan-style scenario developing for the U.S. was always on our minds. I, some of the business economists I know had started to refer to the Fed chairman privately as greenspan -san. Uh, so uh, there, was, there was that concern. Now, the, um, probably it wasn't, probably it was going to work, but, but we were worried about that. Uh, what do you do if monetary policy doesn't seem to be working? And the answer is you do fiscal policy. Um, but there we had a bit of a conundrum. We'd had a huge 10-year tax cut, uh, but with most of it actually phasing in sort of midway through the decade. And so it wasn't, it wasn't really delivering very much money right now. And then you had the tax rebate, which is really a sort of an advance on part of the tax cut for next year, which was throwing in sums that were uh, certainly helping, but wasn't all that much. Um, and we were also, you know, just, just 10 days ago, we were all preoccupied with the revelation that uh, what I could have told you was happening, which was that the numbers weren't adding up. And, uh, and despite all promises to not dip into the Social Security surplus, we were doing so. Um, and so we were kind of stalled on fiscal policy. Now, if you had taken the uh, sort of almost like a mathematical proof here, you say, well, what, what can we do? We've got a long-run fiscal problem. We're in, in deep yogurt if you look at the 20-year uh, prospect because, uh, because of the aging of the baby boomers and all that. Uh, but we also have a short-term, at least prudential need for stimulus. Um, what do you do? Well, if you do a long term, um, another round of long term tax cuts, uh, then that worsens the long run problem. If you do a short run tax cut, which is the uh, one possibility, then there's the question will people spend it? And that's a deeply disputed area. Uh, so, yes, uh, what could you do that would pump money into the economy now uh, <clears throat> without? Uh, committing us, uh, ourselves to, to tax cuts that will continue to drain revenue from the federal government 10 years from now. Uh, and the answer was, uh, the, the apparent answer was a burst of public spending. And so if you sort of worked it through, you said, what, what would a, a good textbook economist say we need right now? You'd say, well, how about some quick public spending, not worrying too much about the details. Um, the beginning of last week, that was just a non-starter. Just couldn't happen. Uh, it, the Democrats were unwilling to propose anything like that because the, uh, they, they figured if you loosened the budget constraint, then the Republicans would just go out there and pass another, uh, another tax cut for, for uh, you know, capital gains or something like that. Uh, the Republicans certainly weren't into big government spending, so nothing, nothing was possible. It was kind of a deadlock. Uh, everything was frozen in ice. Um, what happens now is that we have this terrible event, um, which... Uh, you know, it's, it's a very dark cloud with a very tiny silver lining, but one thing it does do is it kind of changes the terms of the debate. Uh, we certainly know how to spend, well, $40 billion, and I think it, I, I'm guessing we're, 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 heading, we're heading towards $100 billion quite, quite soon on all this stuff uh, without having to ask, you know, if, if you tried a, a program of public work spending two weeks ago, 
Uh, first, there would have been people saying, no, 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 we want smaller government. And secondly, once it became clear that it was going to happen, each congressman would have said, in my district. Uh, that's obviously not the, not the case yet on this one. So we have at least a period of, of fairly rational stuff. Um, the other thing that's happened is that um, monetary policy here and abroad has in some ways been freed up uh, uh, by this event. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a lot of people were saying that really, you know, the, the, the numbers are looking worse than we thought. The Fed should really do another 50 basis point cut soon. Uh, but to do it in advance of their reg regularly scheduled meeting would look like a sign of panic. Uh, to do it by 50 basis points, which is unusual, though it's done, we've done that several times lately, would look like a sign of panic. Nobody wanted to do that. Well, you know, it wasn't the problem doing it now. Uh, the European Central Bank, as Alan mentioned, the, uh, the European, a lot of us have been getting increasingly uh, exasperated with the European Central Bank saying, why don't they do something? Why don't they move? And there was a feeling that they were actually cease, refusing to move out of sheer cussedness that precisely because so many people were, were telling them they had to move, they didn't want to move. The, the pettiness that sometimes dominates policy is, is hard to believe, but it's there. Uh, well, they moved. Uh, this, this time, they didn't have to, it didn't appear that they were giving in to undue pressure. They, they matched the Fed's move on, on Monday. Um, so it, it, in some ways, it's all loosened up. Now, um, this is kind of awesome. It's kind of unprecedented, and it's terrifying. And, uh, um, it, uh, it, one of the things about the tragedy is it, it directly strikes at one of the major elements of discretionary spending, the stuff that people don't have to buy, which is, uh, which is travel and vacations. And so we have an immediate, uh, very negative impact, and nobody knows uh, just how big it's going to be. Um, I think what's going to happen, although it's, it's very fluid, what I think is going to happen is that there is going to be a lot of money rushed into the economy, uh, essentially in the form of public spending airline bailouts and so on, uh, some of which will be badly spent, but this doesn't seem to be the time to worry about that. Um, the political games are going on. Uh, there was uh, horrible stuff going on behind closed doors in Congress uh, this, this last week, but some of the worst stuff seems to have been headed off. Um, and I guess I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic, not for next quarter, I agree, terrible next quarter, uh, that we might well look back at this by, say, the middle of next year and say, actually, this led us to do some of the right things, the things we couldn't do before, which is very, very small compensation for, for the awfulness of the thing, but it, it, is, it is at least a possibility. Thank you. I just wanted to ask one thing. There are people standing. If, if you're seated next to an empty seat, would you just put your hand up so the people standing, if they like to take seats, can know where there are seats? Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jose Shankman on the financial markets. Helen asked me to talk about financial markets and uh, I think the financial markets are kind of a third order of magnitude. Of course, the, the, the human costs and the social costs are the, are the most important. The economic costs come second. Financial markets, from, this point, from the point of view of what's going on, I think are kind of a third order phenomenon. Um, they are mostly a thermometer. And they are very, at this moment, a very bad thermometer because, as both Alan and, and Paul emphasized, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, not only about what kind of economic policies are going to be adopted, but I think even a more basic level, what is going to be the reaction that the United States is going to take and what are going to be the implications of that to the political situation in the world. But let me tell you a little bit about financial markets. Now, one thing that both Alan and Paul emphasize is the fact that, that the economy was already in a fairly bad state when all this happened. There was a lot of uncertainty. The economy was, uh, there was a discussion whether we had uh, um, a recession or not, or a recession was going to come. But that's all has to do with definition, not with anything real. I mean, the economy had suffered a big slowdown in the United States. Japan continued in the same situations before. And Europe, of course, was starting to recognize they were more or less in the same boat. And Paul especially, but I think also Alan, emphasized the, the story of Japan, how Japan serves as this, as this kind of phantom that everybody's kind of worried about. So let me talk to you. So let's start with the parallel. Paul already mentioned Japan had tried very aggressive monetary policy, at least of the kind of classical monetary policy, 
that central banks typically uh, do. They could have done other things, but the kind of classical monetary policy, they've put interest rate to zero. Um, I have another piece of news. Japan also had an incredibly aggressive fiscal policy. Uh, a couple of years ago, and this year is not going to be very different, Japan was spending 8% of GDP. That was the deficit, nominal deficit in Japan. So they were really spending a lot of money. And from the financial, not only that you know, the economy was still you know, not doing much, but from, from financial markets point of view, there's a worse story. Japan started, the Nikkei index started at 35,000 points. Now it's true this index has been adjusted in some ways, but in any case, it was down below 10,000. For a comparison, that would mean like the S&P to be around 400. The peak was around 1,500. So that's something that worries financial markets. But as I said, um, I do think that, that, that the financial markets are, are kind of the tail on the story. And uh, um, we have to wait to see what's going to happen on the policy side and the economic side. So how do I occupy my time? So I'm going to talk about something which I think is actually more important than the short-term performance of the financial market. I do think that when the financial history of September 2001 is written, the most remarkable fact I think is going to be about the financial history yeah, is going to be how the financial system weathered the shock. If you had told me a couple of weeks ago that, that we're going to have uh, a closure of the U.S. stock markets for four days, we're going to close the bond market for a day and a half, European markets are going to continue to go, I would say we'd be in big trouble. This is because a lot of players in, in the financial markets have simultaneously positions in several markets. And whereas European positions were being marked to market, the American positions were frozen. Um, what I think helped here, and was played, it was played the role and actually solved most of these problems, was the reaction of central banks. Uh, these estimates are a little flimsy because you don't really know what to count. But the most conservative estimates for the interventions by the, the Central Bank of Europe, our Fed, and the Bank of Japan in the money markets during that week come up with numbers like $150, $200 billion. That's a lot of money by any, by any measures. Um, to give a measure of this, when things got a little bit better, which was on Wednesday, the banks were lending money overnight to each other at a rate of 1% a year. Right. For banks to lend money at 1% a year, it really means they have nothing else to do with it. They have a lot of it. And uh, this was something that, that it really has helped, I think, the economy. I don't think that's going to have any long-term impact, especially no inflationary impacts, because uh, this liquidity is going to be normally in, is going to be taken away from the markets pretty fast. And any changes on inflation expectations have to come either from losing fiscal policy and the effect of that on future monetary policy. But right now, markets are pretty calm. If you look at the difference between the yield in the long bond and the yield on the floating bonds, you get a guess of what is inflationary expectations in our country now. And it's about 2% a year for the next 30 years. I think it's pretty conservative in terms of inflation. The second thing that helped financial markets weather this was Y2K. Why Y2K? Because in preparation for Y2K, banks and financial institutions in general had prepared a large amount of backup facilities because they thought things were going to go bad in, 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 that, in, that, in that occasion. And I, I cannot tell you how many times I heard people in investment banks, people uh, that do risk management, saying they were being blamed for having spent all that money when in fact it was totally useless, nothing happened. Well, they did use it this time, and this was pretty important. The third fact which I think helped happen incredibly was the LTCM crisis, those of you who remember, because I think that that crisis reduced a lot of the exposure that banks and hedge funds had and made everything a little bit simpler. So in fact, I think all those three things led to this fact, and I think this is going to be an important fact in financial history, the fact that the uh, financial market survived. I want to talk about a couple more specific things also that I think we learned from this. One has to do with the much superior performance that electronic markets have had during this week than uh, the kind of markets that involve a lot of people like New York Stock Exchange. You know, uh, the first four days New York Stock Exchange was closed because it was physically impossible to reopen it. And I think that's going to accelerate a trend which already exists towards electronic markets. Another industry which is going to have a big transformation is going to be the insurance industry. When Hurricane Andrew hit in uh, 1993, the insurance industry uh, paid out about $18 billion in claims. And as a result of, of they lost a lot of capital, and a whole new 
um, form of financing insurance appear. Those are called catastrophe bonds. And these bonds were a form of bringing new capital into the insurance industry. The insurance industry is going to lose something, mostly in the reinsurance side, in fact. And the insurance industry may have to pay as much as 30 or 40 billion dollars of claims, and I, I think that's going to happen again. Let me talk for a couple of minutes only about the market reaction and what I see on the future, although I'm not one of these guys who predict prices, so don't expect to walk from here deciding to either buy or sell the market. The market reacted in a very standard fashion. There was no surprise, you know. The yield on the two-year treasuries, for instance, fell from 3.5% to 2.8%. The dollar fell because this was seen as an attack in the United States relative to the, to the major currencies. Oil, as Alan said, nobody knows what's going to happen. So initially, prices went up by 20%, but prices today are very close to the prices that prevailed on Monday, maybe a dollar more a barrel or something like this. The other way you see how markets are nervous is measuring the volatility which is implied by the price of options on broad indices like the S&P 500. And that one jumped by about a third, went from close to 30% to over 40%. The prices of all risky assets fell, including that, that of stocks trading in Europe. In fact, some European stock indices fell a bit more than US stock indices. Uh, an example of this is the German, the German uh, stock index. Uh, as of yesterday, the German market had fell about 12, a little bit over 12 percent, whereas the S&P had fallen no, only 8 percent. Last night, both the German market and today the S&P, when I left the office, the S&P was falling about 3 percent. The German market had fallen close to that, so the difference stays there. So here's a curiosity. You know, Alan mentioned the Gulf War episode. If you look at the Gulf War episode, it has two portions. One goes from August, which is the invasion of Kuwait, until December, which is until the United States basically uh, started the war against Iraq, the actual war against Iraq. And in that period, the DAX, which is the German index, fell about 30%, whereas the S&P only fell 17%. After that, both indices climbed, but the S&P by the end of January had recuperated all its losses, whereas the DAX um, was still about 20% lower. So in some sense, at least the, in the continent, the, 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 in this other episode, the stock market seems to be more sensitive to the same kind of problems that we've had this time, although of course this time the problem is here instead of far away, but some of the, some of the scenarios are similar. So let me finish by saying that if you want to know what's going to happen to the prices of stocks and bonds, etc., you're asking the wrong guy. A lot of people have opinion about that. I don't. I think essentially prices today reflect the average of what prices are going to be in the future. However, I do think there's a substantial risk that it could be much lower, and that's expressed in this, in this volatility. Of course, that also means that they have to be much higher, otherwise they wouldn't be where they are. But if you're particularly risk averse, I think you should consider getting out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Alan Kruger. Uh, thank you. Uh, Swati organized an excellent uh, panel, which has left me relatively little to say. Uh, when I agreed to fill in for Ben Bernanke, I should have negotiated to go first instead of last. Uh, I, I wrote down five points that I wanted to make, and many of them have been made, so I'll try to cover them quickly. Uh, one of the things I'm struck, struck by in this situation, and as Alan pointed out, uh, and I think very movingly began this session with a moment of silence, uh, uh, is this uh, is not what one would ordinarily think of as an economic uh, uh, tragedy. It is certainly a human tragedy. It may have implications uh, for the economy, but in the ordinary course of affairs, uh, this is the kind of an event uh, that the economy shakes off uh, fairly easily. Um, and what's striking is the degree of uncertainty. And I think uh, that was echoed in all of the comments that you've heard so far. Uh, I concluded the piece I wrote for the New York Times today uh, saying that the economic watchword uh, should be uncertainty. And in fact, it's striking to hear some people discuss the economy, uh, not the economists on this panel, but to hear others uh, making forecasts uh, about what's going to happen, when the economy will turn around, how deep uh, the decline will be, and contrast that with the way that public officials 
uh, are very cautious in uh, uh, determining how many people were killed in this tra tragedy and uh, how deliberate they are in searching uh, for the perpetrators. Um, and I, I think in this kind of a situation, uh, it would be very good for more economists to take that kind of an approach and just try to quantify what it is that we don't know. Uh, how can we say something about this event when we don't have anything like it in our past? We certainly have had tragedies and disasters in the past, um, but uh, never uh, a terrorist attack on this scale. And, and also, as Alan uh, emphasized initially, the economy was at a particular precarious point uh, when this uh, uh, tragedy struck. So uh, one thing one could do to try to get a handle on what to expect is to look at past tragedies. And as I uh, mentioned, as others have said, in fact, Paul pointed out in the New York Times, you know, if you look at earthquakes, they tend to have fairly small, at least short-term uh, impacts. Uh, Longer-term impacts are harder to measure. Uh, a good example, I think, is the Kobe earthquake of uh, 1995. This is the biggest uh, earthquake ever to hit a modern city. It knocked down 100,000 buildings, and it damaged another 250,000. Uh, 6,500 people were killed, 300,000 became homeless. So we're talking about a large-scale uh, tragedy. Uh, within uh, 15 months, uh, manufacturing predict production in Kobe was up to 98% of where you would have predicted it from the pre-existing trend. And, and by the way, Kobe in Japan at this time uh, also had some doubts about its economic medicine. Uh, um, so uh, uh, this quick recovery uh, seems uh, to occur uh, in the situation where uh, even there is some concern about what works for the economy. And there are many other uh, examples like this. Economists are fond of pointing out to the quick growth in Germany after World War II. Uh, between 1947 and 1955, national income grew by 148 percent in Germany. And the conventional wisdom is that when we have uh, tragedies like these, uh, the capital may be uh, destroyed, buildings may be knocked over, but most people survive. And the key element to production is human capital, is uh, the skills and uh, ingenuity uh, embodied in people. And you see that happening in New York right now. I mean, you see how cleverly uh, financial firms are seeking out new office space using hotels which are suddenly becoming vacant. Uh, and that's one mechanism which I think helps the economy uh, to recover in this situation. Uh, another way to put um, uh, uh, the um, uh, economic ramifications into perspective is to think uh, about unemployment. Uh, the airlines have announced, and, and Boeing, about 100,000 uh, job cutbacks. And then suppose you multiply that by a factor of three for the ripple effects through uh, travel and so on. Maybe that's too small a number, but that seems to me to be uh, a, a reasonable kind of number. So 300,000 uh, additional job losses, say, uh, uh, as a result uh, of, uh, of these uh, reactions uh, to the tragedy. Well, the month before the terrorist strikes, the unemployment increased by 550,000. So in terms of the scale of a $9 trillion economy, I don't think we're talking about the direct effects of this tragedy as being uh, particularly large. Uh, what is, I think, potentially worrisome, and as everyone else has remarked, is the reaction to the tragedy. It's the uncertainty that it creates. Uh, and it does seem uh, that it has created a tremendous amount of uncertainty. One scenario is a Persian Gulf War type of response, uh, which uh, uh, we believe uh, had a big role in the recession in the early 90s. Uh, another concern I would have in thinking about the policy response is what do we do about trade and, immig trade and immigration looking forward? Uh, uh, I think to a large extent this tragedy occurred because of immigration policy. Uh, does the United States turn inward and say we're going to restrict immigration, we're going to be a less hospitable country to immigrants? Uh, much of the recovery, much of the growth that we've seen in the 1990s is due to an inflow of highly skilled laborers uh, to the U.S. Uh, you know, one side of this 62 countries had people who worked in the World Trade Towers uh, and were killed in this tragedy. That's just a sign of uh, uh, how international the U.S. economy is. Uh, and when I think about the economic implications, I wonder what we're going to do about immigration policy in the future. I think that would weigh heavily in kind of the longer term, longer term impacts. Um, uh, others were uh, uh, touched on the financial markets and, and consumption. Um, I'm not a macroeconomist, but it certainly seems to me uh, to be the case that the way uh, macroeconomists look at the way uh, the U.S. economy responds is to think of consumption as the dog that wags the dog. Uh, consumption is, uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, uh, 
approximately two-thirds of uh, GDP. If there are changes in consumption, that's certainly going to affect uh, a measured output in a particular quarter. Uh, but one thing I would emphasize, and I tried to emphasize this in the New York Times today, is what happens to GDP is not what happens to economic well-being. Often tragedies like these, when capital is destroyed, buildings are, are, are destroyed and so on, generates an investment boom. Now it's not so clear if that's going to happen given the way the financial markets have responded uh, in this instance. Um, but the investment boom usually raises, raises GDP and uh, systematic studies of earthquakes and hurricanes often find uh, GDP growth stronger in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the tragedy. Uh, but if you look a few years out, it's uh, much less clear whether there's a positive effect on economic activity. In fact, it's probably more likely to be a negative effect because the economy has less capital, has used up more of its uh, reserves, uh, energy, and so on uh, than it otherwise would have uh, if the disaster didn't occur. Uh, so that certainly makes us worse off. And then there are many aspects uh, which affect our uh, economic well-being of this tragedy which are just not measurable. Um, you know, the fear that people feel uh, when they fly. Uh, that is something which is not going to enter into GDP, but it certainly is going to affect uh, the way we feel about ourselves. I wanted to make uh, two uh, small policy comments. Uh, one is, in thinking about uh, people being uh, thrown out of work in response to this tragedy, I think a, a major response is unemployment insurance, and the automatic stabilizers are, uh, are important uh, for a number of reasons. One is it gives people more cash to spend, which helps the economy. Also, it helps people uh, to get by. Uh, New York State, it turns out, um, is not in the best of shape in terms of reserves for the unemployment insurance system. Uh, New York uh, has the second lowest uh, reserves if you look at uh, uh, the money in the system uh, prepared to pay out in case there's a sudden uh, increase in unemployment insurance claims. So I think that's something that uh, is going to have to be grappled with. Um, then uh, the second uh, policy issue I was going to uh, comment on and uh, uh, Paul was commenting on this kind of thing before the tragedy, but when one looks at the, the budget uh, several years out, uh, I suspect that, uh, uh, you know, in the traditional conventional wisdom, the, uh, a tragedy like this uh, has relatively uh, little uh, effect on short-term uh, output, uh, but might have a lingering effect, a bigger effect, a few years out. Uh, well, if that's the case, if uh, GDP growth is, say, lowered by a half a percentage point, a uh, percentage point uh, three years from now compared to where it otherwise would be, uh, that makes uh, tax cuts that were legislated far off into the future at a time when we thought the budget situation was uh, different than we think it is now, uh, much less desirable. Uh, and uh, as uh, Paul has written in the New York Times, I think um, uh, rescinding some of the already legislated tax cuts uh, to pay for the current relief uh, uh, makes sense from that perspective as well. Thank you, Alan. Uh, we've been joined by uh, our colleague Peter Kennan, who was teaching up, up until a few minutes ago. Uh, Paul Krugman has to get to class pretty soon, so what I'm going to do now is open the floor to some Q&A, and then we will pick up Peter Kennan uh, uh, speaking about impacts on some other countries than the United States. After all, it is a big world, uh, after we do some Q&A. Who, who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir. Yes, you. Yes, you. And say it loudly, because we're in a big room. Are we on? Yes, we are. Yes, you. You want to paraphrase the question. Yeah, the question was whether... Uh, if there's a war in the Middle East, whether by raising the price of oil it will, uh, it will offset any expansionary impact of, of, of the spending that's about to take place. Um, of course, as, as, as Alan said, uh, none of us has any idea what kind of war we're about to, to fight, uh, and one strongly suspects that nobody, even in the Pentagon, has any idea exactly what they're going to do just yet. Um, my guess, completely amateur, is that the, we are talk, we're not talking about anything that looks like the Gulf War, that we're talking about much smaller scale actions, although there's, there's this thing that's floating around that, that, that Iraq may somehow be associated, and that changes everything if it's true. Um, 
Is it unpatriotic to say that I'm, I don't like the name of this military action? Operation Infinite Justice kind of suggested uh, I'm a little concerned about where, what, what that might mean. But anyway, the, um, 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 my guess is that it's, it's uh, let, let me put it this way, most of that, uh, most of that 100 billion, we don't have 100, we have, we have 40 that we know about, but I think it's, it's rapidly going to escalate. You were speculating about 100. I was speculating about 100. I think the great bulk of that is not going to be uh, uh, military in the normal sense of the term. We're talking about uh, airport security. We're talking about, I, I'm wondering, I assume that somebody's thinking about municipal reservoirs. Uh, I think we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, P Marshall Plan for New York City. Uh, we're talking about uh, a lot of, of things that, that don't involve uh, troops overseas. And, and I, I don't think, you know, I, I think we really are about to get a domestic stimulus package of, the, of, a, of a size that, that would have been inconceivable before. So that's a, that's a plus. Yes, I see. I'm giving preference to students, but please go ahead. If I said our immigration policy was the reason this occurred, I misspoke. Um, what I would say is it certainly is related to, to our immigration policy. Um, many of the people who were involved, it appears from the news reports, were in the country illegally. Um, now, I had written actually previous to, to, to this disaster that I think U.S. immigration policy needs to be reformed. Um, immigration policy is quite complicated. It's not only done for economic reasons. That's probably not even the main uh, motivation. But the major uh, uh, principle used for immigration policy to the U.S. today is family reunification. And from an economic standpoint, that doesn't make all that much sense. From an economic standpoint, I think what one wants to look at is to say uh, uh, which uh, um, types of immigrants are going to add the most to the economy. And um, you know, from my perspective, a more rational system of immigration would put more weight on the skills that the immigrants bring with bring with them when they come to the U.S. So, um, um, you know, if, if I were uh, advising Congress on re rewriting immigration policy, I would recommend putting uh, uh, emphasis on skills of the immigrants and less weight on family reunification. Um, what I uh, fear may happen is uh, there will be a, a tightening of the borders across the board, um, which um, I, I think uh, when, when the economy does pick up, um, uh, will uh, lead to slower growth because uh, immigration is an important source of growth in the labor force. Um, and um, I also uh, uh, wouldn't be surprised if we see a continued um, uh, reaction on the part of some small number of people in the public who have been attacking immigrants. You know, there have been reports. In fact, I thought it was quite striking. Uh, and one of uh, uh, President Bush's best responses so far was to go to a mosque. And I really thought that was quite striking. But you do see this indiscriminate response uh, 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 towards immigrants who are not you know, of the same religion of the people who were involved in this attack and so on. So it, it may be, you know, this is just speculation, but it may be that the U.S. Uh, will become a less hospitable place for immigrants in the future as a result. We take the gentleman in the green shirt. Do you want that, Jose? Do you want to take I, that, Jose? Or do you want? Let me just say that, that I, I think well, that. Paraphrase a, the question. Paul. The, oh, the question was now that we've had the, the revelation that, that, that short selling uh, in the stock market may have been part of this, that the, uh, what I've been thinking of as the terrorist hedge fund uh, hypothesis. Um, that, uh, that uh, well, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's also grisly if it's true. Um, is, the, is that a negative on short, uh, against the practice of short selling? I think I'm going to ask Jose to talk about short selling and its value to the market. Uh, let me just say that I, you know, I got bombarded with rumors about this stuff, and I got hold of uh, Floyd Norris and the other people at the Times and said, what do you know? And they said, we don't know anything. And that's still apparently the case. 
It's one of these things that, that makes sense in a kind of way, but I don't think there's any confirmation. Did you want to say something about that, Jose? Short selling? I don't yeah, actually I mean, uh, the benefits of short selling, of course, is that it brings prices closer to what they should be in equilibrium. It's one of the ways in which markets equilibrate themselves. Perhaps the easiest way to so I, I, don't really, I don't really see any particular problem with short selling. There would be pauses that they could have. There would also be probably things they could have done. Because they could have done a bunch of short-term treasuries, which were, which were bound to go up in price, and they could, have, they could have bought those at margin. So I don't think short selling, it may have been used. I kind of doubt it. It may, may, have, been, may have been used, but certainly not the only strategy that's possible. Well, let me say something here, actually. There, was, there, there, there are many issues which may or may not might, may or may not have helped in this case, but, but certainly bear looking at One of them is money laundering, I mean, the whole question. And, and we were moving towards what appeared to be loosening the controls on money laundering, partly because they, they are not very effective, but also out of a kind of general feeling that, that the government should get its noses out of this. And I, I think one of the salutary effects of this is that we're going, not going to do that. And, and uh, uh, the, 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 down, the, the negative is, is, alas, this was also apparently a very cheap terrorist or, uh, operation. Yeah, that's what they seem to I just want to add, I believe the, the largest collection of what you might call financial detectives ever in history at the SEC, the Treasury, and in foreign countries is now assembled and in the process of being assembled. Short selling leaves a paper trail. Uh, and uh, in, a, in a perverse way, uh, it would be a good thing if there was some unusual short selling, because it will be found out in very, very short order. For all I know, it's already found out if, if, if it has happened. Who else? Let me, I haven't looked at this side of the room yet. This gentleman right here. Okay, the question was, will long-term interest rates come down as, as I was saying they would eventually, or I hope they would, uh, in the face of this spending? A hundred billion is not a, a <laughs> hundred billion is not a lot of money in the long-term perspective, not for the U.S. government. You know, we have to update Everett Dirksen, a hundred billion here, a hundred billion there, and soon you're talking about real money. But uh, the, uh, uh, if it's a one-time hundred billion dollar spending, that's not such a big thing. Um, everything depends on what happens, on how the politics plays. Uh, and it seems, uh, we should have had a political scientist on this panel, it seems to me equally possible that this event will lead to uh, all the dams will burst and we'll have tax cuts for everything you can think of and, and when the baby boomers start to retire we'll say, oh, we should have been thinking about that, shouldn't we? Uh, or that this will, everybody will say, wait a second, we've got significant uh, uh, defense bills and so on, maybe we should reconsider that tax cut and we'll actually end up with a, uh, a larger 10-year budget surplus than we would otherwise have had. I have no idea which way that's going to play. And, but, you know, the bond market is thinking about this. It, the, the, the bond responses were amazing. The, the short term is way, way down, and the 30-year is substantially up. And, that, and that's... Uh, up in yield. Not substantially. Well, okay. But the, the steepness. Really. Yeah, it's very clear that people think that the short-term interest rates will be much lower for the next couple of years and significantly higher later in the decade. right here in the center in the red shirt. Yeah, I, I think the question I can, I'm not sure I heard you to correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the question was which sorts of military operations among the uh, many that could be envisioned would have the most positive effects on the U.S. economy. That was the question? I mean, I'll, I'll we have a consensus. That's yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would hearken you back to uh, <clears throat> what I said. Thank you, Paul. Uh, what I said earlier about Middle Eastern geopolitics and the price of oil. To the extent that it is feasible and also makes sense, given <clears throat> the results of the dete what you know, amounts to detective work, to limit this to, say, Afghanistan, the Taliban, and so on, 
So we're staying away from Iraq, Iran, Syria. They stay on our side, for example, if we want to imagine the best. You asked what's the best scenario. I think that's the best scenario. Uh, so what you do is you get some more military spending. You get some more civilian spending, as Paul was saying. You do not, in that scenario, get a world energy crisis of any sort. Maybe you don't even get higher energy prices at all. You might get lower because of the world uh, recession, in which case both the spending and the monetary policy and the fiscal policy, uh, uh, sorry, both the energy prices and the monetary policy and the fiscal policy are all positives for the U.S. economy. The energy, by the way, is positive for all the economies in the world that are net consumers of oil. I think that's the favorable scenario. The ones that become less favorable, despite probably larger military spending, are the ones that extend their geographic reach into the oil producing uh, countries. Those, I think, are quite worrisome. Anyone want to add or subtract anything from that? No. You know, the only thing I would say when I think about it is that you want to make a distinction between the short run and the long run. And I think for the economy, from the short run standpoint, a Clinton-type response, which was cruise missiles, and that was about it, maybe it hit some tents, you know, maybe people were there or not, would probably be the best from the, the short-run standpoint. But the question for the long-run standpoint is what strengthens the security of the United States the best? And I don't think that's something that, that, that uh, you know, I feel qualified uh, to comment on. You know, as long as that sort of subject has been broached, not that we expect you to speak about uh, military tactics, Peter, but this might be a good point for you to uh, interject a few minutes on, in recognition of the fact that it's a large world and the United States not the only affected country. I had the misfortune to arrive just as Alan Kruger was speaking of the folly of forecasting uh, under these conditions of uncertainty. And I certainly am not neither an amateur nor a professional forecaster. Uh, but I'm going to try at least to suggest to you what some of the ramifications could be uh, on the supposition uh, that at least in the short run the U.S. economies will deteriorate, conditions will deteriorate, that they could con deteriorate considerably before they get better, uh, and that securities markets will labor under enormous uncertainty for at least the next several months. I'm not looking much beyond the middle of 2002, if you wish, but I don't see a resolution coming much before that. Um, I'll be talking about the impact on others, uh, but the story I'm going to tell is not good news for the United States, because the story I'm going to tell is of difficulties all around the world, all of which means that the rest of the world may be buying less from us, and that will be an added drag on the economy. This is not a one-way story. It's not simply the transmission of the effects from the United States to the rest of the world. It will be, unfortunately, the transmission then or reflection of those effects back upon us, uh, which will have uh, some significant effects on particular industries as well as the overall economy. Uh, to begin, let me recall something that most of you probably do not remember, certainly students do not remember. At the start of the 1990s, we had a rather odd situation in the world, and many of us were sort of scratching our head and saying, uh, everything's upside down. It is the expansion of the emerging market countries uh, in this world uh, that is providing a stimulus to the industrial countries, whereas we'd always thought essentially of the, of the industrial countries as providing the stimulus to growth in the periphery of the world economy. Uh, it looked the other way for a while, and this was a rather splendid development, we thought. Of course, the distinguishing characteristic of the day today is that there is no one propelling an engine forward anywhere in the world. Uh, if you look around the world, there is no economy that is growing well, maybe one or two, uh, certainly no major region that is growing well, uh, and that all the forecasts uh, are for some deterioration and certainly some delay before uh, we get a, a significant economic revival. Uh, my impression from talking to my colleagues before this meeting and from what I've heard now is that most of them are moderately pessimistic about the short run for the U.S. economy, that things may get worse before they get better. Uh, that certainly would appear to be the case, although oddly enough, perhaps less severely in Western Europe. Uh, Japan is in recession, no matter how one measures it, uh, and the situation there looks to be getting worse before it gets better. 
And one has to say that uh, uh, the major emerging market countries of Latin America and uh, Asia have been in trouble for some time uh, and are likely to suffer more uh, in, the, in the months ahead unless uncertainties are resolved very quickly and the stimulus to the U.S. economy uh, leads us out faster than I think is, is likely now. In a sense, the situation of the world economy with long, those of, of long memory, the situation of the world economy is more like the early 80s, where there was uh, a recession everywhere, uh, than like the early 90s, where, as I said, the, uh, one of the more important growth-propelling uh, forces in the world economy was the growth of the emerging market countries, and I will come back to them in, in just a moment. A few words about some of the key economies in the world that I think we have to think about. Uh, First of all, our near neighbors, some of you may not realize that Canada and Mexico are the most important trading partners of the United States, and they will be, there is no question about it, hard hit by any further softening of the U.S. economy. Mexico has already experienced a substantial slowdown of growth, uh, and that will obviously be aggravated by any further slowdown here. Uh, other countries in Latin America, however, will suffer uh, well, Canada is not in Latin America, I should say. Other <laughs> countries in Latin America will suffer too. Uh, one of the trouble spots in Latin America, on which a lot of us have focused attention for a long time now, has been the situation in Argentina, uh, where the hope is that a very austere fiscal policy will allow that country to get control of its debt situation uh, and avoid either a devaluation or a default. Uh, the IMF has just bet another $9 billion on that outcome. Uh, and the fate of neighboring countries depends partly on what happens in Argentina because Brazil is subject to contamination uh, from anything that does go wrong in Argentina. Well, the problem here, of course, is that a slowdown of global economic activity reflected in a slowdown, a further slowdown of the Argentine economy means a further loss of tax revenues and greater difficulty for Argentina in balancing its budget, uh, even more severe austerity political resistance to further belt tightening and therefore the specter of default or devaluation rises once again sooner than it otherwise might at a time when the intention of the world's policymakers are not a focused are not focused on Argentina uh, they're focused elsewhere one hopes that they have one eye out for that situation and for neighboring countries uh, Venezuela and other oil producers in Latin America could fare b better if oil prices do go up uh, it's good news for some people, if not for others. But I think, as a couple of people said, we just don't know what's going to happen to oil prices. Uh, <clears throat> the decline in airline activity, as already indicated, uh, will reduce the demand for jet fuel. Uh, obviously, any major military disruption in the Middle East, and that's where the mention of Iraq comes in, uh, is a wholly different story. We just do not know where oil prices will go, uh, so they're unlikely to stay where they are. Turning to Russia, no, to Europe, and first to Russia, Russia, of course, is a major oil exporter, and the, in the short run, at least, the fortunes of the Russian economy may be, may be highly dependent on what happens to the oil price, and here again, uncertainty, I just do not know. <clears throat> My impression is that the situation in Western Europe, the economies of Western Europe, <clears throat> was before September 11th more favorable than the outlook for the U.S., the figures we have just seen this week on what the U.S. economy looked like before September 11th suggested further deterioration. There was at least some reason to believe before September 11th that the European economies were bottoming out, and there was indeed some danger of, of inflation in the U.K. Um, my impression today is that, uh, is that Europe remains, perhaps at this moment, better positioned than the U.S., and that the recession there may not be as severe. Uh, with one important exception, and that is that the decline of international tourism, which is virtually inevitable for as long as uncertainty persists, and well beyond that perhaps, will do serious damage to, to London, to other major destinations, uh, to the Mediterranean, and by the way, in the Western Hemisphere also to the Caribbean. Uh, just one more, turning the other way to Asia. Uh, Japan, as I said, is already in, in very deep difficulty. Uh, and the worldwide decline in stock market prices uh, will, of course, make the situation there much worse. Uh, it seems to me now unavoidable that the Japanese banking system will experience a very substantial crisis in a matter of weeks or months uh, as the uh, precariousness of the position of the banks becomes fully uh, clear and, and revealed by the end of this month, and that will have to happen given their accounting practices. They must 
disclose their positions uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, yesterday, the Japanese apparently did what a lot of us were hoping they would do, were hoping for some time they would do. They would intervene to stabilize the yen uh, and would do so essentially by printing yen, uh, something they've been very reluctant to do. Uh, one can only hope that they will go on doing it. Uh, certainly in this situation, the last thing any of us want, neither the Japanese nor ourselves, uh, is a, a strengthening of the Japanese currency, um, which will only deepen their very severe recession. And they are a drag on the whole of the Asian economy, as well as the global economy, because they are the second largest e economy in the world. China, I think, may slow down a bit, but is more nearly insulated. The really serious trouble spot in Asia uh, are, the southern, are the emerging market countries such as Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, already in very deep trouble. Uh, they have experienced declines in their exports much more severe than those which triggered the, uh, the Asian crisis of 1997. Uh, they are experiencing the worst recessions they've seen since uh, World War II, uh, and the uh, prolongation of our uh, uh, recession, if it is that, uh, cannot but hurt them worse. Malaysia is a country that exports about 70% of its exports to the U.S., uh, and about 80% of its exports, or thereabouts, uh, are electronic-related goods, and that is a very precarious uh, position. Uh, the International Monetary Fund has already reduced its forecast for global growth this next year, 2002, and I would frankly be surprised if we see anything in excess of 2 to 3 percent for the world economy, even if China powers ahead at a fairly substantial rate, and that's now a big, a big chunk of the world economy. Let me wind up with just one comment. Are we likely to see a hard landing for the dollar? I don't really think so. Uh, one of the ways in which people deal with uncertainty uh, is to seek safe haven. The short-term U.S. Treasuries are certainly a safe haven. Uh, and the U.S. stock market will probably look as good, if not better, uh, than the stock markets of many other countries, even if they all behave poorly for the next several months. And so I don't anticipate a massive withdrawal of foreign funds from the United States of the kind that could precipitate uh, a significant, uh, a very large depreciation of the dollar. There will, incidentally, be some improvement in our huge current account deficit, our big trade deficit, uh, because with growth slowing here, faster than it slows elsewhere, uh, we'll see our imports decline uh, even as our exports decline, but by less. And that is a narrowing of our trade deficit. The difficulty, of course, is that that decline in our imports is the decline of other countries' exports and therefore tends to weaken their economy. It is sort of a dysfunctional adjustment uh, to the imbalance in our international trade. Thank you, Peter, for spreading the good cheer around the world. Uh, uh, the, the floor remains open for questions. Yes, right there. Say, say it loudly so I can hear you. Right. The, the, the question had to be, uh, the question had to do with the uh, up to now mostly neglected part of our economy, the investment sector, uh, which had a lot to do with the boom and the bust. Uh, my, my brief answer to that, and anyone else who cares to speak to it uh, can, is that while the decline in business investment was a very major part of the slowdown in the U.S. economy that we've had over the last uh, several quarters. I don't want to say it's, it's hit a bottom where it can't fall further, because it can, of course, fall further. But I think the, the uh, downside risk from business investment is now relatively low, only in the sense that it's gotten so bad it can't get that much worse, can get somewhat uh, worse. And that's why I emphasize the consumer. I furthermore feel that the course of business investment over the coming quarters is going to be, I don't want to say dictated, but close to dictated, highly attuned to, let's put it that way, the behavior of the consumer. That is, if businesses see prospects for selling 
their wares uh, with a very short lag, they'll be investing more. If they do not, if the consumer gives up and we really do uh, uh, go into a serious recession, then I think you're going to see another considerable down leg on, uh, from coming from business investment. That is exactly the accelerator mechanism to, uh, to which you alluded. Yeah, the, the upside is what, uh, is what I was uh, saying at the beginning. If, in fact, we get a so-called V-shaped recovery, so let's just, to be spuriously accurate, because nobody knows what's going to happen, suppose we go downhill at a fairly rapid rate for two quarters and then snap back very fast. Then I think you're looking at a scenario where about three quarters from now, business investment starts coming back very rapidly as it sees as businesses see the prospect of an improving uh, economy. Wolfgang. Peter, I think you want the euro question, et cetera, ought to be for you. Can I answer it well? Can I be relieved of the need to answer the second one? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Wolfgang, uh, you and I, I think, both agree that the introduction of the euro is a momentous event in, for Europe and ultimately for the world economy. Uh, I don't think that the what we are going to see on the first weeks of January of next year, that is the introduction of euro notes and coins and the replacement of the existing currencies of the 12 participating countries, the Deutsche Mark, the French franc, all of which will vanish uh, in, in just a matter of weeks. Uh, I don't, th while that may have long run effects and certainly the introduction of the euro itself as a currency will have long run effects uh, on the international role of the dollar, it will eventually become a competitor to the dollar in international markets to a much greater extent than it is now. Uh, I don't think that the actual events of the, of the next few months, that is to say the introduction of the notes and coins, will have any very substantial effects. I indeed have my fingers crossed because I'm a firm believer in Murphy's Law. Uh, something is bound to go wrong. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, those things that do go wrong don't have uh, longer lasting effects on people's confidence in the euro uh, and on the stability of the European economic and financial systems at this precarious time. So I would be happy uh, if one got through a fairly smooth and benign transition. I don't think that uh, uh, we can count on much in the way of uh, of stimulus or, or a revolutionary change in the international system. Uh, as an immediate result of the introduction of the euro. On your second question, let me, let me try to answer a piece and, and, then, and call on Jose Schenkman. I mean, in some sense, the answer is you can never prepare for anything like this, but let, just uh, one observation and then... Oh, sorry, the, the question was, uh, uh, since you're all such a bunch of experts, why don't you tell us how we could prepare in advance to, uh, for something like this? 
That, wasn't ex that was almost your question. <laughs> uh, uh, just one observation. It had been said, going back already to the last year or two of the Clinton administration, that for reasons that I will uh, spell out very immediately, we were un unusually well armed with fiscal and monetary ammunition in case of a recession. So what were those reasons? We had low inflation and at that time a federal funds overnight rate of about six, six percent, six and a half percent. So there was no deterrent on the part of the Fed from the inflation front to lower interest rates quite substantially and they have and they will continue to. Secondly, we also had the federal budget in very good shape, showing a large surplus and hence we could afford to do as much as Paul Krugman's hundred billion dollars if necessary without in fact going back or at least not going back much into uh, deficit. So I think the answer is that once you get over the hard times you try to reload the monetary and fiscal cannons. In the case of fiscal policy that means getting back those surpluses to, to where they uh, once were. Now, Jose wanted to add another point also. Yeah, I think Alan really touched the most important point is how, how the economy and the aggregate can prepare itself. The other two points, one I mentioned when I spoke, which is the idea that financial markets were capable of weathering the storm of great proportions, and that I think is something they prepared themselves to. It, didn't, it wasn't Greenspan waking up in the morning, what do I do today? That, that was not the way it was done. And finally, you know, as individuals, you can all diversify, you know, don't hold too many insurance company stocks or, 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 or such things. Now, perhaps we could have a market in which this risk will be traded, but that market I think will be subject to a lot of moral hazard. Right here. The question is, what kind of advice do you think President Bush is getting uh, uh, right now? That was a general question, and the specific uh, uh, sub-question was, uh, is he hearing some of what Paul Krugman has uh, said about the uh, unwisdom of heavily backloaded uh, tax cuts? Uh, as to the latter, I think from his own advisors he is not hearing that. Uh, from outsiders, to the extent that he's listening to outsiders, I think he has heard that quite a bit and will continue to uh, hear that. My, you know, part of my reaction to this is what was the correct policy before is even more so now and that would be in terms of tax policy to front load it much much more and get rid of the back loaded part so that we do essentially nothing negative to the 10-15 year out fiscal picture but we do a lot positive to boost spending uh, now, I, w I was saying that, a number of other people were saying that before this crisis. I think that takes on greater urgency. Now, I would be shocked if President Bush acted on uh, advice like that. Uh, there, there is, I read in the newspapers and hear from Washington people, a substantial debate going on now. I think it will be shortly over over the advisability of fiscal stimulus with some people saying let's go slow on this let's be sure we need it before we jump in there with more tax cuts or uh, more spending and some people saying as essentially I was and Paul was and, and several of us were uh, we oughtn't to be waiting anymore uh, we know that we need uh, stimulus and we ought to be applying it tomorrow that debate is going on in Washington now. Uh, from what I read in the papers, President Bush seems to be hearing both sides uh, of that. But I, I think that will be, my, my guess is that will be quickly overtaken by events. You've got the need to rebuild New York. You've got the airport security. Uh, you've got the airline bailout. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be more. Anybody want to add? Yes, Alan? I, I just wanted to add, I don't, I think the way to think about this is the dynamic that's taking place, which is not just President Bush taking advice from his 
uh, National Economic Council and Council of Economic Advisors. Bring your mic closer. Uh, I, I think really the question is what is the Congress saying to the President? And my reading between the lines, and I think the Congress really united and kept its feuds, which I'm sure there are the feuds that they were having before behind closed doors, uh, which is much to their credit. But my guess is the, w what will come out will be some kind of a compromise. Uh, that's the way the congressional process works. So to the extent that we end up paying for some of the things, you know, the, the congressional budgeting takes place in a 10-year window. To, to the extent that we end up paying for some of the things from the future, it'll, that'll be coming from the Congress as part of a compromise. That's right here. Right. The, the question was, what do we uh, think uh, both normatively, that is it a good idea, and positively, like what will happen uh, to the, uh, with the airline bailout? Who would like to take a crack at that? You should, you should know that Jose, who's hesitating here, came to us not too long ago from the University of Chicago, where the answer to that question something. is clear. But. <laughs> I think I should say something. Um, let me start with this following point. The airline industry was in a lot of trouble much before uh, what happened now. Uh, some people claim airlines have never made any money. Uh, some people claim some airlines made money, but at a loss more than those that made. So it's a, it's a confusing picture. But certainly they were in trouble already. And I do not think, and I don't think there's a particular Chicago point of view, that we should be on subsidizing industries which are not making money, you know, you have to tell me what's the social role of that industry, you know, why do we need it? Then we can make this discussion, not just because they lost money. Now, there's a different question here, which I think is a question that's deeper than just what you're going to do for the airlines. It has to do with questions such as airport security. I do think it was a grave mistake to trust airport security and to impose the cost of airport security to individual airlines. I don't think they had enough as we economists, now our jargon say, they were not internalizing all the effects, all the important effects that bad security has. And, you know, although American Airlines president may, may be upset at what happened in, in, the, in, in the World Trade Center, he certainly did not account, he said, he did not account all those costs on deciding how much to spend on airline security. So from that point of view, I think that that's important, that the, the country should do this. And then we should think about the transportation system as a whole, this is a country which does very little subsidy, for instance, train, train travel. You know, and I don't really think why we should subsidizing airline travel before we, we decide how much train travel we need and everything. So that's a Chicago answer, by the way. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Alan? I yeah. just wanted to add a little bit. I, I mean, in some sense, on the, on, on the normative question, you want to say, where's the market failure? Is there a market failure? And it seems to me that you can make an argument that the consumer is being somewhat irrational in the near future, that the risk to flying is not, probably has not increased all that much uh, in, in the months ahead, um, but yet people are scared. And, um, you know, in economics we're usually very reluctant to say that people are making mistakes, but I think that uh, if you kind of look at the risks they face by driving to Pittsburgh instead of flying, it's probably uh, safer to fly, uh, even in the new environment. Uh, so to me, I think the environment has changed temporarily which would lead to want to have a not a permanent subsidy to keep airlines afloat, but a temporary subsidy. And, and I think Jose raised the question which um, uh, we really need to look into very closely. When it comes to public safety, do we want to contract out and what's the right way of, of arranging that and ha uh, how do we delegate that responsibility? You could say the same thing about maintenance of airplanes. Uh, you could have the same type of uh, uh, concern. Now, for, for reasons uh, that I'm not sure of, that's worked very well. Uh, and it doesn't look like deregulation, which caused more competition among the airlines, had much of an impact on, on airplane safety. Uh, but I think you could raise the same types of questions uh, there, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do get reexamined. Thank you. I haven't looked over this way for a while. Yes. For, for me next.
Uh, yeah, the short answer to that is yes. The, 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 the question had to do so was uh, supposing we have a uh, significant cutoff of Middle Eastern oil coming out of this uh, episode, would that be a bad thing for the U.S. and other uh, others of our trading partners? Western, well, not just Western uh, economies, oil importing economies, which is most economies in general. The answer is most emphatically yes. I think that is the potentially largest but impossible to handicap risk in all of that. Nobody knows what the odds of anything like that happening are, but if I just take your conditional question, suppose it happened, uh, you have a potential for replaying the events of 1973-4, which led to a worldwide, worldwide recession, uh, and a recession in the United States that we then called the Great Recession, not knowing that when OPEC struck again in 1979-80, we were going to have a bigger yet a recession, which is now called the Great uh, Recession. So these are potentially, uh, should it happen that way, very, very large uh, negative events for the U.S., for Western Europe, for Asia, uh, and uh, therefore for the whole world. Anyone want to add anything? Peter. Let me try to distinguish between two things because they are important in trying to answer your question. One is a case in which there is an attempt to boycott the United States, to refuse to sell oil to the United States for political reasons. The oil is there, but it is not sold to the United States. Uh, we had an attempt of that kind back in 73, when some of the Arab OPEC countries did an attempt to boycott the U.S. It was not especially successful in and of itself because oil can be transshipped. It can be shipped to, to customers in Europe and transshipped to the United States. Furthermore, we can get more from Venezuela, from other places, from Mexico, uh, and replace oil from uh, the Middle East. Uh, the much more serious possibility would be a major disruption of supply, uh, which would not be political, but uh, the consequence of military action. But it's hard to believe that anything uh, that one cares to contemplate uh, would lead to a complete uh, shutdown or, or even substantial shutdown of oil from Saudi Arabia all the way to Iraq and so forth. Uh, I don't think that's a, a high probability event. On the other hand, I didn't think what happened on the 11th was high probability either. Just, you know, let me see if there's someone else. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the, okay, the question is, what kind of tax policy would I be advocating for the next uh, 24 months? The, the, the general answer, as I gave before, and then let me try to flesh it out a little, is tax policies specifically designed to spur or bolster consumer spending. So what might that mean? Uh, one example is to give uh, a, uh, well, it wouldn't be a tax cut. To, it would technically be a transfer payment to the people that did not benefit by the tax rebate, from the tax rebate, there was something like, I'm trying to remember the number, 35 million American households, that sound about right, that did not and are not going to get a rebate check for the simple reason that they didn't have any income tax liability. Now, they paid payroll tax, they paid sales tax, they may have paid a variety of other taxes, but they did not pay any federal income tax, and hence there was nothing to rebate. These are obviously very low-income people and uh, many of whom are living hand to mouth. And it seems a good bet that if you give them another $200, they'll spend 199 uh, of it. Whereas if you give me another $200, I will not spend another 199 uh, of it. So that's one example. A second example which I've suggested is a temporary reduction in state sales taxes with the revenues reimbursed by the federal government. You will not have the states rushing to cut their revenues. Uh, most of them have balanced budget requirements of one sort or another, but it would be relatively easy for the, uh, st all the states that have a sales tax, which is almost every state, to cut their sales tax and have the federal government give them the revenue back so that the federal government winds up. It's as if, it's as if we cut the federal sales tax, but of course there is no uh, federal sales tax. A third, ex uh, third uh, policy that I have uh, uh, pushed, and if I had more time in the last few days, I would have written an op-ed doing this, but I just have not been able to, is there's a, there's a program that has, has existed as an idea and was once tried in California, some of you may have heard of, this called Cash for Clunkers. 
I don't know if you ever heard of this. The idea of cash for clunkers is you offer for people that are driving around in near derelict cars, which among other things are fuel hoggish and to say they're environmentally insensitive is, a, is an understatement, uh, to bring them in and to be reimbursed more than their market value by the government. This is a way to, again, who, who, who drives these cars? Poor people, basically. This is basically a way to also hand money to poor people while at the same time you take some of these gas guzzling and polluting vehicles off the, uh, off the road. And the hope and the idea is some of these people will then turn around and buy a better car. And they're not gonna, these poor people are not going to buy a brand new Mercedes, but they may buy a eight-year-old used car, the, the seller of that will buy a two-year-old used car, the seller of that will then buy a new car. And hence you get some stimulus to the economy. But the important thing is that it's another way to put the hand, money in the hands of people that need it and are extremely likely to spend it. And there are other suggestions uh, as well. Who would like to speak about the, anyone here like to speak about the capital, the question was what about a capital gains tax cut? Yeah, I do. Uh, if he doesn't say the right thing, I'll say something too. Sure. I cannot think of an economic problem we have now that a capital gains sales tax would solve. Okay. Uh, the only perverse view of the capital gains sales cut is that if they cut capital gains taxes, then people who are going to have to sell their stocks at losses are going to have less losses to claim, and then the government would end up with more money. That may be a rationale, but there's no real economic problem you can think of that this the cutting capital gains tax solves. I don't have to add anything to that. <laughs> That's why I pointed to him. Um, I, I would mention a couple other things. One possibility is an investment tax credit, which would be much more better timed uh, than a capital gains tax cut. Uh, Alan mentioned uh, trying to do this in a way which is uh, uh, progressive in terms of the tax structure. An obvious thing, and one I think the Congress is considering, is a cut in the payroll tax, in the social, a temporary cut in the Social Security payroll tax. Um, or, or Medicare payroll tax. And then a third issue, which uh, I'm not an expert on, but I understand is going to be considered, is uh, carrying forward tax losses. And in particular, if one business is taken over by another, can they uh, get a benefit from, uh, fr from the losses accrued by the first business? Okay, uh, let's see. It's right here in, in the back. Sure. I, I think if I interpret your question correctly, the, the question is, do I see anything that we now seem to have a consensus about the need for uh, monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus, and do I see anything that could break it apart? Uh, uh, I do, be, in the sense that not so much on the monetary, which is in the hands of a very small number of persons, one, uh, but on the fiscal side, you need to have something that both congressional parties and the president can agree to relatively quickly if you're going to do any good. Yeah. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to set aside policy suggestions such as the cut in the capital gains tax that are political hot buttons and you know already before you open your mouth and advocate it that the parties are very strongly divided. Uh, on this. The Republicans tend to like it. Not all Republicans, but most do. And the Democrats tend not to like it. Again, some like it, but most don't. And so you're just looking for partisan trouble if you uh, push a policy uh, like that. Yeah, the question was if the whole thing hinges on the consumer who is two-thirds or more of the U.S. economy, would it be advisable for President Bush to do the opposite of what President Carter did in 1980, which is to exhort people to spend more? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Now, uh, the, um, how much effect this will have on consumers is a good question. I was one of the many people in 1980 that was stunned 
by the, the quantitative magnitudes of the effect that Jimmy Carter had in talking down consumption in 1980. If you had asked me in, 19, in February of 1980 whether how much I thought Jimmy Carter could talk down consumption, I would have poo-pooed the idea, but he did. Uh, most of what's in me poo-poos the idea that George Bush could talk up uh, consumption, but I can see no harm that could be done by that. Help America go to the mall. And that, that's exactly what Giuliani's been doing. A and Alan, good, I don't think... No, that's that. exactly what Mayor Giuliani's been doing. Yes. The question is, are we, less, and are we in the world economy less vulnerable to oil spikes than we were 20 years ago? I think the answer is not much. Uh, the, the part that says we are, and I can, maybe some others want to add to this, is that uh, the oil or the energy intensity of U.S. GDP is lower than it used to be. So per dollar of GDP, we use less energy. We still use much more than the Europeans and the Asians and so much and we, so on. We could go a lot further in that dimension. Uh, but in terms of the fraction of the oil that is imported, I believe it's larger than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, but our sources of supply are more diverse, and bear that in mind in terms of any political disruption or, or military disruption, that, the, uh, that uh, in the short run, at least, we are not as heavily dependent on a small number uh, of Middle East producers. Anybody else? Right here. The housing, the question is about the housing, the amazing strength of the housing sector, and can we expect it to continue? We just, yesterday, I think it was, yesterday had the first negative report on housing starts. The housing sector has been the superman of the economy uh, and seemingly impervious to everything. Now, this is not totally mysterious because lower mortgage rates have played a very big role uh, in that, but the report on housing starts, the initiation of housing, that comes out once a month, came out just yesterday for August, I guess it was August housing starts, and they were down substantially. So that's ahead of this crisis. I cannot believe that this does much good for uh, housing starts. That's an under, understatement. The, the, but the point I should uh, underscore that with is that while housing is very, very visible and has been a real hero in the last uh, year or so, it is about 4% of GDP. So it's not that big a deal. Anyone want to add anything or subtract anything from me? Menachem. Right. The, the question was, wh what about the, what, what might be, I'm paraphrasing what you said, the kinds of frictional costs of uh, doing economic activity, transport costs getting higher because of security and, and other reasons, more security guards and a variety of other things that will reduce the question to which the answer is yes, won't that reduce the productivity of the uh, U.S. workforce? Uh, who would like to speak to that? I'm the default answer, but so, go ahead and... Well, a couple parts to it. I think the direction is certainly right. How, how large an effect, we don't know. Uh, it's something which I think one might be able to get some handle on. The, there are time use surveys and things like that, and you can make some rough estimate on, on, on what the additional transaction costs will be. My guess is that that's largely short run. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but I, you know, I would imagine six months from now, airline, assuming the economy pulls out, if we have a V-shaped type of uh, downturn, um, things will return pretty close to normal. 
I think one thing which was interesting would be to compare to you know what happened what what happens in Israel, which is under you know as you know more constant terrorist attacks than we are, or well, I'd be curious what, what what you think. I mean, that would be one thing that I would would. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think, uh, to, to disagree slightly with Alan, I agree mostly with what he said, I think some of this diminution of productivity due to the uh, lessened efficiency of the transport system and more security guards and so on is going to be more or less permanent. Nothing's forever. I don't mean it goes to the infinite horizon, but it's going to last a while. I remember that when people were trying to puzzle out the mystery of the productivity slowdown in the United States, one of the things on the list, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth down the list, was the increase in security guards, uh, which do not, are not productive in the normal sense of the term, uh, but, are, but are were deemed to be increasingly necessary to conduct business, and I think we're going to see a lot more Ellen, of may, that. May I just add one thing? Sure. I don't see in what's down the, coming, coming down the pike at us substantial frictions in f interfering in the movement of goods travel of persons, perhaps, uh, but I, I, I cannot see that, uh, that uh, FedEx packages are going to be subjected to the kind of increased security that you and I may be when they, when they reach Newark Airport. So I, I'm not, I think you can overestimate the, 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 the frictional effects here. Any others? Yes, sir. Uh, Yeah, I, you, want, do you have anything to say about that? I believe some of them still do, actually. Is that right? I don't know if any one of them still do, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They're providing us a service, and if the only way the, the bank makes money out of your deposits is by lending it. If the interest rate is not very high at a certain point in time, they may want to charge you for the service of the checks and so on, and one way to do that is to give you, to charge as a proportion of account, or they can have a fixed charge or something like this. This is not particularly bad per se. I don't know what Japanese banks are doing, by the way, but I would imagine they must, if they're making money, they must be charging their customers in some way. Maybe it's not a negative interest rate, maybe it's cost per check, maybe it's the cost to maintain the account. They certainly are not making money with the customer's money in the overnight rate. We're not making much money that way. I might. I mean, it's best. It's, it depends. But typically, the money I keep in the bank is the money I want to spend, right? I mean, are we talking about investments, money I keep for investments in the bank? Yeah, those are harder to go negative. That's harder to go negative. I doubt that even Swiss banks ever pay negative amounts. I don't think Unless there was did. a lot of crime in Switzerland. Okay, I think we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Yes, sir. would like to speak to that. Thank you, Alan. Thank me. I'm elected. Uh, there, there were prior to this tragedy people thinking about scenarios like that. I don't mean crackpots. There are always crackpots. But serious people on the pessimistic end thinking about that. I mean, after all, Japan has been in the 10-year doldrums with, uh, uh, with uh, deflation. Whatever probability you assigned to that scenario prior to September 11th, and for me it was extremely minute, 
It has to be bigger now. There isn't any question. So if you were a semi-believer in that scenario, you're probably a true believer in that scenario now. To actually get what in, um, the, in modern parlance would be called a depression, you would have to um, you would have to have the governments of the world do a series of stupid things, as indeed they did in the 1930s. That is how we got such a worldwide. There were bad things that were going to cause troubles, but they were exacerbated by policies that, from a modern standpoint, look almost incomprehensibly dumb. Uh, now, I don't believe we're going to see anything remotely close to that now, and to take up your, the last part of your question, but go back to the United States, I'm less optimistic about the rest. This kind of V-shaped slingshot effect, uh, what's going to propel it, if it propels it, is indeed the highly expansionary monetary and fiscal policies that we already have in place, and I'm confident will continue to, uh, to put into place. So this will be the last question right here. You were waiting. I'm going to give that one first to Alan, who wrote his... Uh, column this morning half on that subject or part. You want to, this is a very hard question. I, I think what makes this situation different Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the question was can, can you look at precedents and try to guess what might be the economic ramifications on people's behavior? I think you were thinking especially of consumers where, uh, of an event like this. That was the essence of the question. I think what makes it difficult to do that, we can look at other events which cause similar amount of disruption, uh, similar loss of life, um, but it's the tremendous uncertainty you know, to know whether this is a one-off event. If it's a one-off event, as I suggested and others did, this is something that the economy would be pretty resilient to, um, uh, tragic as it is. Um, and you know, hopefully the President will clear up a lot of the uncertainty this evening, I think. That's one of his goals. Um, but I, I think until we know more, I think people will say, I'm going to play things safe. Uh, I think that's one reason why we'll see a cutback in the housing markets. I mean, that's kind of a natural reaction. Um, and, you know, I think if, if people were going to say more than that, it really is just a guess because we don't know what the response is and we don't know what the response to the response is going to be. It's entirely possible that the military positioning that the president is doing now will have a desirable effect and lead to a quick conclusion and people will be rallied and um, it's also entirely possible that this will be a protracted period of uncertainty. Um, and I think that's what, makes it, that's what makes it different. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, all the panelists. And Thank you. And, and thanks to Swati Bhatt for organizing this and to all of you for staying so long.